Hello and welcome to Pax Americana, a conversation about world affairs, global conflict, military strategy, and anything else that happens to be in my mind. Today is my first inaugural go at doing an interview, having a guest, and I chose as my first guest the guy that I believe is the uh, most interesting man in the world, and no, not the Dos Equis dude, uh, but rather Ryan Nordali, who uh, distinguished himself in many ways. Among other things, he happens to be the only person I know, I know other people, uh, who served both in the in, in both in the British Army and in, and in the French Army, um, and he uh, has many thoughts on warfare, military culture, uh, media. The, he's also a war movie buff, etc. So uh, before I ramble on, I would like to hand the proverbial microphone on to uh, Ryan. First of all, thank you so much for coming on to this channel. Uh, it's to me, it's a it's a real honor plus a, a pleasure. Uh, so who are you, Ryan? Well, my pleasure too, actually, uh, Michael. So I, a, I am a, uh, um, a veteran, um, and as you said, both French Foreign Legion and uh, British Army, where I served in the artillery for 13 years, and that's my most recent military experience. I am now working for a um, private company in defense, and, I mean, everything you said is, is pretty much uh, on the money, so... Um, I don't have much more to say except that you know the I think the praise the high praise is a little bit undeserved. <laughs> but you 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 served in Afghanistan, correct? You did a tour, two tours. I did I did I did one tour um, in Afghanistan, absolutely, mm -hmm. and um, which which gave me um, a, a, a lot of um, food for thought. And I will come back to that when we talk about you know. Um, Technicization, because um, I think the um, the Great War on Terror was also seminal uh, in 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 bringing um, footage from the soldiers to the um, basically back home unfiltered. Uh, but we'll come back to that. I think I think later in that in, in that interview when I talk about you know when I do short like history run of of. Um, of those things, but well, what then is the difference, though? Why? What is there anything special about the Great War on Terror? Well, yeah. First, it was access to um, technology um, that wasn't that common before, uh, and I'm especially thinking about helmet cams, the GoPros, um, Go GoPros, absolutely. Um, and there was a train, a, a sorry, a trend. Uh, for um, war porn footage, as people would put it, mm -hmm. um, and they were making their way to uh, YouTube, to uh, Reddit. Uh, however, there is a difference to with what we see right now, especially in Ukraine and currently um, in Gaza. So, what exactly is the difference then? Well, first of all, it was uh, access to internet was regulated in those theaters. The the soldiers would not use the um, the networks, uh, the civilian networks that were available to the civilian population. In Afghanistan, for instance, we were told we were told that the network was actually uh, run by Iranian companies, so we were absolutely forbidden to use them. Mm -hmm. um, so we used uh, Wi-Fi if we had it on the base, which could be turned off. And it was, uh, uh, it was called up minimized. And of course, we also being professional soldiers were maybe more aware of OPSEC. We had come from, especially in the British Army, but it was the same in the French Army, where um, soldiers could have been in the past targeted by, uh, targeted, uh, by terrorist organization. I mean, before the French went into Mali, for instance, um, they were targeted by uh, Mohammed Merah, for instance, mm -hmm. um, right. in the first terror attack, b even before the uh, the Charlie Hebdo attacks. Um, and the British, of course, were aware of that because of the whole Northern Ireland troubles, and, and they knew not to um, to raise their profile too much. So we were aware of objects, so we wouldn't release things just like that but i mean the the the, the access as i said like access, access to wi-fi meant that most of the that, that um helmet cam footage 
was mostly for private use, but would eventually um, come out through, you know, sharing and whatnot, but usually after the tour and not immediately during it. It was more like people coming back from Afghanistan or Iraq with a, a, a hard drive full of like what they had shot and that would release them afterwards. Right. Um, and what's interesting is that initially the chain of command didn't know how to deal with it because it was a first. Um, there, there, there was, uh, uh, and the reactions range from, you know, uh, outright ban, because right. when I was on tour, for instance, um, helmet cams were actually, uh, had been banned, to actually allowing the footage to go to TV documentaries. There was a series of documentaries called Our War that aired, I think, on Channel 4 or ITV in the UK, which were basically uh, made by uh, TV, but they, had, they, they made it from uh, footage taken by the soldiers on tour. And that included basically the guys uh, I took over from. There was a whole episode that was taking place in the checkpoint, uh, actually, uh, where, where I was deployed for, for six months. So uh, there were things that were basically allowed to get out and even, you know, um, uh, pushed to uh, mainstream media. Not now, so much I, in... I, I... I yeah. would suppose that most of the time the soldiers making the footage weren't necessarily doing it to serve any kind of political purpose. It was just, this is what I'm seeing, this is what I'm doing. Kind it's, of innocently. It's interesting, it's interesting because in Simon Aikam's um, book, uh, The Changing of the Guard, he takes mm -hmm. uh, uh, quite of a very critical look, uh, which may or may not be unfair, but uh, there, there, there was also a... Because you know you would you you would record anything and do some war porn um, uh, from time to time. You could you could say that some behaviors could have been triggered by the fact that you were going to record things. I give okay. you an example uh, when when we were calling an airstrike to because we were taking fire. Basically, between the time when that airstrike was called and the time when it actually happened people would literally ask some guy who wasn't needed with his rifle to go down and get their cameras. But it's anecdotal, and that's personal experience. It, it may not have happened, but people, people were looking to come back with souvenirs. And just ha as, you know, back in the days, you might have collected scalps or ears yeah, or just right. like, you know, um, buttons from, 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 uh, from coats and things like that. Or helmets, spiked helmets. Uh, you could, you could. The way we came back with souvenirs was with that footage. I think that in Mali, uh, the French held a very tight control uh, over over those um, those behaviors. Um, I haven't seen actually much um, war porn uh, leaking from Mali. No, I've seen very little. I think there's an effect. I remember watching some of the footage from Iraq, which reminded me of that terrible TV show Jackass. Yeah. Uh, right. It is so like jackass goes to war that somehow there's a with young people, there's a propensity, willingness to kind of be, frankly to be a jackass because there's a camera on. on um. Yeah. And that, that wasn't the, uh, the the worst of it. I mean, uh, you had trends, uh, one of one of which was the um, how do you call it? How oh, the word escapes me now. Oh, uh, lip sync dubs mm -hmm. you know where you would put a song and you would record something and so you try to basically take it in just one take for instance and other things like that uh, of course we would do like goofy videos and that was basically that was also same thing some sort of a a, a, a souvenir but more collective and more of a, about you know um things that well you know uh, bound us together you you, ha you also had that so what happened then i mean you, you said that the you you hinted that there was an evolution from that to what we're seeing now, the Ukraine or, well, or Gaza. I'm I'm going to go back a little bit because it's it's there's a there's a level of that whole time frame. I mean, if you if you look at back, all right, um, and war when it's represented usually has a purpose. It, it can be propaganda. It can be souvenirs. Souvenirs are you know as old as 
military things. You know, Roman soldiers, when they were getting buried, for instance, they would have something mentioned on their um, their uh, headstone and things like that, or their, their decorations represented on it, and, and so on and so forth. Or, the, you know, um, the, the um, loot... Uh, was part of you know what they were supposed to to, to bring back. But go, going back to maybe more recent time, uh, as I said, like you know military uh, representation in art, you know paintings about battles and things like that, they would happen sometimes. Like they, they were made years, if not decades, after the actual battle, mm -hmm. and, and and that basically stayed the same until the advent of um, photography. And all of a sudden, that time is already shortening. But during the Crimean War and the Civil War, for instance, uh, those uh, those those um, those pictures, even if you have the uh, certain shock of it, because for the first time you actually see bodies, you know, battlefields strewn with like uh, with the dead, um, it's not you don't have any sort of pictures of the actual fighting. It's not possible due to technique of the time where you have to you know pose and stop mm -hmm. in order for the picture to be taken. Uh, and it's not before World War One that you actually see um, pictures. But even then, and that's also interesting, uh, they are very scarce. You have very little. And most of the time, they are not made by professional. They are made by the soldiers themselves, who were amateur uh, photographers and who took pictures. Um, and they've managed to capture us from time to time from the trenches, you know, snippets of actual fighting. But most of the pictures of World War One are actually also posed. Mm -hmm. They are reconstitution. They are outright propaganda most of the time in the form of postcards and greeting cards. And it carries into World War Two, um, where you have actually a mixture, except that the that the proportion is sort of like is reversed. You have more actual pictures than propaganda. However, the most iconic are still post propaganda pictures. Um, the uh, um, Reichstag, for instance, picture with the the Russian uh, soldier hold, um, right. hoisting the flag, is both posed and doctored to raise, you know, the the wrist watches. The looted wrist. wrist watches. Yeah. Right. And of course, uh, Mount the, uh, Mark, yeah, yeah, I was about to go there exactly. Yeah, that's a classic. Yeah, Iwo Jima, Mount Rubachi. But you you actually also had actual pictures uh, in Tarawa, for instance. Roosevelt himself weighed in to have pictures of dead Americans on the beach mm -hmm. so that it would sink in uh, the mind of the American public that that's it, they're at war and their sons are dying. And, 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 and it worked. It was actually, a, a, um, um, it served its purpose. And fast forward to Vietnam, then you have TV. And there's a misconception because people don't think, oh, that's it, Vietnam was live TV. It wasn't. It was TV, but not live. Yeah, I don't think the technology existed really to have it live. Yeah, no, it was basically, they were, they were basically uh, recording on film stock um, mm -hmm. because you didn't even have like a, um, VHS back in the days. And they were sending them uh, very quickly via, most of the time via Hong Kong actually, um, back to the US. But... Uh, it's sort of unfiltered because the journalists there have sort of free reign and access, at least uh, from the American side. And, you know, it carries on into Lebanon, Salvador, and even to the Falklands where you have this uh, massive issue of the BBC, for instance, revealing to the, to the Argentinians yeah. where the British are actually, <laughs> where and when the British are actually uh, going yeah. to land. Um, and this is solved in the Gulf War. And the Gulf War... Where, it's really interesting because you actually have live broadcast. We have it, mm -hmm. except that it's very tightly controlled. Now, the access to the battlefield, to the areas, are tightly controlled by the military. And as I say, we go, we go on to the Great War on, 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 um, on, the, on Terror. And I like how you call it the Great War on Terror rather than the yeah, Global great, War on Terror. It makes it sound what? so much more like the reality, I feel like, is just so tawdry and prosaic and great war makes it almost elevates it to something uh yeah more exciting well, I, mean, than I think it actually was i have I have, I have to pick it up because i was part of it uh <laughs> <laughs> fair enough i guess i was too in a <laughs> yeah um 
but as I said, like all of a sudden, you still have that tight control of a journalist. All of a sudden, you have uh, that access that the individual soldier has to recording implements. Mm -hmm. And their eagerness also to film their war. They want to have the footage of that A-10 close air support mission. Right, because it's cool. Because it's cool. And this is, this is the beginning. This is, I think, the root of the tacticalization. What's really interesting is um, what Ukraine made of it because they weaponized it. So we go on to TikTok and to meme culture all of, mm -hmm. all of a sudden. And you have a complete weaponization of it by the, especially the Ukrainians, with the, you know, the uh, NATO fellas, for instance, yeah. <laughs> whatever uh -huh. that is. Yeah, uh, it's a strange phenomenon. But you, you do have you do have great propaganda value because all of a sudden you had like pe people liking all of the social media kill cams uh, of you know uh, russian armored fighting vehicles uh, getting getting um, uh, stricken by uh, you know um, bayraktars or whatnot set to techno chart toppers yeah yeah uh, and it it almost became a format that's it you did what are we going to, uh, to to remember from the war in Ukraine? It's basically footage of from drones from time from time to time from from uh, from from FPV drones of vehicles getting hit by you know um, uh, indirect fires or other right. drones, and often with the it's soundtrack, right. with Usually the soundtrack, like a metal soundtrack. Uh, it's techno. It's most of the time it's techno. techno. Okay. But yeah, yeah. But it, it, what's interesting is that the, the music they use is exactly the same music that uh, an influencer would set to a video of uh, him working out or, uh, you know, of, in sort of like funny things you see on Instagram and, 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 and TikTok. And what's interesting is that while they were all doing that, they're also exploiting the Russian use of it. So they, they are, you know, scouring... Um, uh, the, the, the Russian telegram for open source intelligence and all sorts of like, you know, cyber and electromagnetic uh, domain operations. And the third use of it, um, it's, it's um, the legal implications. Uh, the Ukrainians explicitly tell you that they're gathering evidence uh, for future war crimes prosecution by actually, you know, lurking into uh, the, uh, the the Russian Telegram channels. Mm -hmm. And that had already been the case that had started already during, you know, the, the war in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, because uh, one of the high profile uh, war crime case in the UK against UK personnel, um, known as Marine A, uh, but whose name is now, we know it, um, Alexander Blackman, um, for uh, shooting an an armed and wounded um, Afghan, uh, probably an insurgent, but he said it was like mercy killing. But that was all recorded from those helmet cams. Just kind of stupidly, right? Sort of in a self self incriminating, oh, for the sake of the trophy. I this is this is this is the the weird thing. So. Uh, Remember, as I said, like the uh, during during the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, it was to collect souvenirs, mm -hmm. um, and it was mostly for uh, your own use. It wasn't supposed to get out. Now, for Alexander Blackman, it's not his own webcam. It's like the webcam of someone who was with him, okay. and it was a little bit weird because he was from a different unit and he was basically reattached to another unit. And I mean, there's all sorts going on. Uh, I'm not going to delve into it. Um, because it's still complicated and quite touchy, a touchy subject uh, because but he we, has received a, a lot of support in the UK. Correct me if I'm wrong, we didn't see a lot of that coming from the Taliban side. Like, they weren't doing footage. No, so no. So they could have, right? They had this uh, well, ability well, to... No, hold on. They to... absolutely did. Okay. They did. You, 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 I mean, all their ID strikes, etc. they would film it. And that started in Iraq, actually. 
it was initially Al Qaeda that was basically shooting uh, footage, and it was like it was going around, and it it was even going going back to us. I mean, we were gathering whatever intelligence we could from it, but we that was they were aired for us when we were doing you know ID awareness training. At least half, if not like three quarters of the footage, were actually footage taken from. Uh, captured cell phones and, 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 and so on from the insurgents that had filmed their ID strikes, their ambushes, their um, indirect fires using mortars and rockets, uh, etc. Um, they were doing it and for uh, propaganda and recruiting value. Uh, no, it was happening a lot. Same I, as us, if not more. Right. I'm under the impression that um, the Syrian civil war was a big step forward. That, that I feel like I've seen more footage of of attacks, GoPro sort of footage, right, of like missile strikes against Syrian tanks and whatnot. I feel like I've seen more coming out of the Syrian civil war than I did out of Afghanistan. Uh, and maybe um, it's just that, that the technology already had gotten that much better. So maybe the technology, the technology maybe got like a little bit more uh, accessible. Uh, I'm thinking like we, we had helmet cams, we had the actual GoPros, which, you know, cost what they cost. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, like, the, f the fact that you had basically Chinese knockoffs coming on the market gave more access to uh, populations that wouldn't have access to them initially. But there was also, um, I think, um, how would I say that? As I said, um, we, we, we sort of, we were more aware of OPSEC, which might... If, if not, it's not, it might not be the case for them, but they might prioritize propaganda and recruitment over OPSEC. Fair enough. So they are, maybe it's not the, 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 the fact that, they are, that there, there's more footage on their side, it's more that they are more willing to release it and to spread it. Because they need to show that they're doing it. Yeah. Right. In that context, a lot of what I'm seeing now coming out of Mali makes sense because now Mali, the, the jihadists actually are producing a lot of fairly high quality video of their attacks. But I can see the propaganda value of doing that. Oh, I mean, I mean, the you look at the Taliban's game in terms of like propaganda, how they got super savvy about it. Mm -hmm. um, you look at what they do now, even though they basically won the war. Um, but they're still like you know producing things. Yeah, you, you look at what they do now. They they are basically on on the same level as us in terms of quality of the videos. So what about now? Then I feel like this brings us to now. Like you, you know, you've been implying, particularly with TikTok, you're talking to about the TikTokization. Yeah, TikTokization. Yeah, There's something because, new because, happening. Yeah, it's 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 the whole um, immediacy of it. And um, as I said, like uh, you, you, you have a weaponization, but it's a two-edged sword. Um, right. You look at the use of TikTok by Hamas, for instance, and other terrorist organizations for like the value. Uh, the shock value was sort of a net positive for them because that's what they were looking for: shocking right. people, I including their October seven footage, especially the October seven. Yeah, footage. and there's a lot of it. Yeah, but it sort of backfires. Because, like, all of a sudden, past that initial shock, uh, when you have actually the IDF going in and looking at the crime scenes and basically gathering the evidence of, like, mass mur the mass murder and the sexual violence, all of a sudden, the footage that you had seen and been shot with, you look at it again and you can see the evidence of it, of that se sexual violence and mass murder. All of a sudden, you see it. You, you make sense of those images. Right, you can put it beyond, together with the other beyond, evidence and get a full... Beyond what Hama, exactly, beyond what Hamas wanted to show you, all of a sudden you see the reality and the consequences. All right? Uh, um, I'm thinking of this absolutely horrible footage of, you know, the half-naked body of this poor girl in, 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 in the back of a truck. Yes. And that, that will incense both the, popula both the population, the, the, uh, the Israeli population but also if people are not too biased um any sane person uh in, in the world mm -hmm. um however when the idf went into gaza all of a sudden the personnel which and i'm going to remind it 
are actually most of the time reservists or people doing their military service. Uh, the current social media vids are also eroding the sympathy uh, that the world initially had. And if it falls short of evidence of war crimes, a lot of them are bro broadcasting um, the intent of ethnic cleansing mm -hmm. from part of the personnel. And that could be used at a later date if there is some sort of like judicial proceedings after the operations. Right. But in both one cases, thing that I find interesting, though, is that um, and I say this also because I have teenage boys, right? And, yeah. and they are very much into the, I've banned them from using TikTok, but they still see it anyways. You know, they see it because anything that's put on TikTok is also put on different platforms and whatnot. But they're really into Instagram Reels and YouTube Shorts. And they're definitely in this culture where this is what you do. So I could also imagine that, plus actually my son's now going to join the U.S. Army this summer. Um, uh, but I could see that people in that culture, you know, I'm thinking of the 18, 19 year old IDF soldiers that are very much in this culture. And probably a lot of the people they're fighting are of the same culture. And I bet they've seen the same memes. That this is now this thing. It's this feature of... of the battlefield where for better or for worse and very often for worse people on both sides now have these smartphones and they're taping stuff that's exactly. sort of, every, it's both good and bad depending i mean every single soldier now mm -hmm. is basically has become both um an intelligence asset right and a war reporter but TikTok is TikTok. It's actually controlled by the Chinese and to a certain extent also by, you know, the rulers of China. The content that they promote for Europe, the US, well, North America, etc., and the content that they actually allow at home is completely different. A young Chinese on TikTok has things about like you know space exploration science arts etc etc when the chinese absolutely um promote contents like you know influences um supposedly funny things um or, or to to the western audience the algorithms are actually different mm -hmm. and of course china being china behind the great firewall um the they of course control completely uh, what's happening on tiktok so they might have uh, i'd say an interest into the misuse of tiktok by um military personnel yes not that I don't want to get into like some sort of like conspiracy theory like you know that they they're controlling it they're not but um, they might have. I mean, TikTok. TikTok basically the the way the way the uh, the version that they gave us um, is allowing for this kind of content to exist, and it's content that is actually a live grenade. It could backfire on whoever is using it. So how does this change warfare? I mean, what does it mean other than that we have more entertaining? garbage to watch or war porn well, that's the thing um it it doesn't change warfare in itself uh but now that we're more and more reminded of the of a klaus of uh take on, on on war and warfare and how mm -hmm. eminently political it ultimately is i I, th I think that um the tacticization uh of 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 war is sort of a, a stark reminder uh, of our need to control um, the narrative, but not just the narrative, because as I said, um, part of that footage, as I said, like in in Ukraine, for instance, is going to be gathered by the uh, the the Ukrainians uh, from Russian channels. It's going to be harvested and is going to be used. That knowledge might actually influence future behavior of the Russians. Or maybe not. Mm -hmm. But at least 
it still gives Ukrainians something also to fight for, is bringing those people um, to justice. And that is something that you, you, you have to take into account. Equally, um, the fact that the IDF is not keeping a tight control on the TikTok contents that are coming right. from the front lines in Gaza. It's surprising. It really is. I don't think it is. I think it's sort of intentional. I think it is still to sort of like keep stoking that fire of the anger from the 7th of October. Because they're playing also, if they're playing for the domestic audience. Of, and, of course they are, yeah. Right. I mean, because I've seen this. I see this on social media that there are things that I see like Israelis retweeting that I like, I kind of cringe like, oh, I'm not sure <laughs> retweet that, to be honest. Um, but it's like, I can see how like some of this content, it's pleasing to a certain audience. And it's meat for that certain audience, even though but, those of us who are outside that audience might look at it and cringe. We, so it's so a we question almost of prioritization of what your audiences are and balancing but, I mean, that out. We, we know, and I'm going back to the, not necessarily the Chinese intent, but the, the Chinese have an interest in, in, into that. In both cases, um, uh, um, uh, and I mean the use by terrorist organization and the use by the IDF, um, it's a gauge of the radicalization of populations. And just like you can move the overton window on social mm -hmm. media, tacticization of, 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 of war um, might, in, in, in the case of the, Gaza, the current Gaza conflict, harms any attempt to rally uh, foreign support and foreign opinions. Well, foreign, foreign opinions first rather than support. I, I, I'd say that, to a certain extent, the fact that it is uh, allowed by both sides is telling me that they want to radicalize their own populations and they don't care so much about what sort of support they could get from outside mm -hmm. and it's also telling me that this war is basically and that's both belligerents are basically vying uh, for internal supremacy rather than rather than anything else, really. You mean and their own, within, within their own domestic audiences? Yeah. Yeah. And maintaining and reinforcing their grip on the populations. Yes. I mean, I, I would only disagree to the, to the extent that um, I see the Hamas side as being more mindful than the Israeli side of the public opinion, the world public opinion. You know, I've written about this idea of the external maneuver that... that <sighs> You know, it's all about kind of getting people outside the area enraged yeah. marching into that they put pressure on, on Israel. Whereas, um, I mean, there's obviously an Israeli effort to do the same thing. But they, so either I mean, they, 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 they're so, not less focused on it, they're, maybe they're just not as good at it. I, I don't know, but that's what I see happening. Yeah. Uh, I mean, right now, I haven't seen any sort of like footage coming from, 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 from Hamas since the 7th of October. But whatever, the, whatever came out of the 7th of October uh, might have sort of had some, some part of the, uh, the uh, um, Arab and Muslim populations cheering. But at the same time, it, it has absolutely like horrified uh, uh, pretty much a good part of the rest of the world. Um, so in that, in, in taking this into account, I'm, I'm not sure that they're actually trying so much. And I haven't seen like since then, and since the, the idea of actually started like striking back, I haven't seen that much. It's different, however, with like what's happening in Lebanon, Hezbollah, and and uh, uh, and Iran. But that's 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 another matter altogether. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen nearly as much stuff coming out of the Russian side of the Ukraine war. Is it maybe just that I'm just not I'm not on the right Twitter channels? Like a, yeah, no, they they actually they they actually sending a lot of things. Um, but mostly to social media that are in use in, in Russia. So mostly Telegram channels, um, which, you know, are not really interesting. But, I mean, um, on Telegram, at least, that's where we had all of these absolutely grim uh, war crimes committed by the Russian army and mm -hmm. the, the different um, private military contractors working for them, including Wagner. Mm -hmm. And you had a... Um, a lot of things that were, uh, as I said, like that, that got picked up, and it's also interesting in terms of like what it tells you about the Russian population, because like 
when you see the content, you imagine like, surely they should be horrified by this. And then you realize that they don't. Um, and this is where I think like, okay, so that that's Russian public opinion is actually has been brutalized by the regime and years of internal propaganda. Mm -hmm. And they can absolutely stomach that. And to them, it's normal behavior. That violence, those war crimes are acceptable. They see nothing wrong with that. And this is why I was saying, so there's uh, that Overton window has already moved in Russia. What's happening in Gaza is that those idea of soldiers pushing TikTok uh, with the blessing or indifference of their chain of command is also pushing that window. Yeah. I suspect it's more indifference. I don't know. But I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like you'd have to be inside a, an Israeli battalion to know who's ordering what and what the rules are and who's doing what and whether or not anybody's exerting what kind of control on anybody. I mean, maybe there are written rules saying do this, do that, that everybody's ignoring. Or maybe there are, you know, maybe there's a nudge and a wink saying, you know, I think you could have the whole spectrum of it. But end of the day, the general, the general sentiment is that it's more or less allowed or basically ignored. Mm. Right. But people it, are letting it, it happen. It does stand in contrast with what I've read about uh, back when Israel was occupying southern Lebanon. That I, I remember reading about how the advent of cell phones was causing a problem because of like these IDF soldiers were going on patrol with their cell phones, and among other things, Hezbollah was getting really good at at tracking them, finding them, listening in on their phone calls, and sometimes these fools apparently the the soldiers would um, like while they're out in patrol, they would actually order a pizza that would be like waiting for them back in the base. Right, so it was like massive OPSEC problems, and it took the idea for a while to respond to this and realize, like, you know, holy crap! And this is this, yeah, out. you got to leave is, your this, cell phones behind when you go out on patrol. This is this is what least. I was talking. Yeah, this is what I was talking about, like uh, Ukraine exploiting the Russian the Russian use of social media in the um, cyber and electron ma magnetic domain, um, and this is something that happened, like uh, you know, just before the invasion, um, two thousand and three, already invasion of. Um, of Iraq, mm -hmm. um, British soldiers ordered a pizza in Northern Ireland, and they got, got shot. Or there was a drive-by. That 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 thing is 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 is. But it's we, we're getting out of the whole thing of like filming, putting footage to music, right? But just imagine actually, though. Imagine also, also if... porn. You because you that, that's the thing. Tacticalization, and that's the difference also with war porn. War porn. You are filming something else you've got your helmet cam mm -hmm. you are filming that airstrike that um that you requested uh the artillery strike or you basically you know receiving rounds uh behind the berm tacticalization of war is different so in ukraine as i said it's more like uh, it's still kill cam um tacticalization is also you filming yourself doing stuff Influencer style, right? So right. you put you putting your face right there, and you expect it to receive loads of likes and to be shared, but you are also going to do things for that. You are going to do things that will attract those likes. So it changes your behavior. It triggers new behaviors. You're going to dance in a room in Gaza. Whereas otherwise you wouldn't be dancing in a room in Gaza, right? Yeah. It's like the presence of the camera and you, you're doing it because like, oh, I yeah. can go into this house and I can film a quick video of myself and be all, all singing, out. all singing, all singing in front of a pile of bodies and what I mean. Right, 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 right. So, so it's the idea that it changes the behavior. It uh, creates double-edged swords, right? These double-edged blades that can both serve a propaganda value, but then it also can be turned on somebody. But as I said, a, any, often it, there's an intel uh, value of it to anybody who's scrutinizing this video. Yeah, and 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 an illegal one in right. terms of like further or future, uh, as I said, uh, judicial proceedings. So we've got that, and as I said, it's it's also as I said, it's a gauge. You can take the temperature of the whole society, and especially 
It, what's interesting in both Ukraine and Gaza is you have non-professional soldiers that are plucked straight out of the civilian society. So if they are not the society itself, because we're still talking about a certain like, you know, um, age range, for right. instance, and it's still overwhelmingly male, even though you have female uh, on the front line, it's, they, it's not 50-50, uh, far from it. Right. And, you know, and also they don't have the same roles. You still have very few female in combat roles. Um, but it, it still is some sort of a, 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 a gauge of um, what these soldiers think society is expecting from them what will make them popular or liked i'm thinking out some of the worst footage i've seen out of the nagor karabakh conflict where there was a bit of this and i i, I recall one thing where um it seemed to be Azeri, azerbaijani soldiers executing some armenians I and mean, it's brutal stuff but of iranists i've seldom seen from other conflicts Regardless of whether or not that kind of thing's been happening in other conflicts, I'm sure it does. But that I I I missed out when I did my little history run. I missed out on um, an episode um, that started in the Balkans and that carried on during the first Chechen war, mm -hmm. and that was the snuff film. Yes, from soldier of actual torture um, and executions. And that started, as I said, in the Balkans. Uh, you have that brutalization of of of, of, um, of the combatants there, um, and then it carried on in in Chechnya, where you had absolutely grim stuff of um, Russian Russian soldiers being beheaded by Chechen rebels. Mm -hmm. So. Um... You've spoken about the effect that TikTokization has on the soldier, his or herself. Yeah. Uh, what, what effect, though, does it have on the society? I mean, one of the things that I'm struck about, you know, with TikTok is because it's such a short form. I mean, I'm picking on TikTok, but any of these things, Instagram Reels, etc. There's something about the short formness of it, the immediacy, but it's also, it's very fast, it's very grabbing. And so, I wonder if, like, psychologically, like, does this have a much greater impact on the brain than... You know, I'm thinking about like the TV coverage of the Vietnam War that CBS used to do. So I, this is very I'm not, different. Yeah, I'm not even 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 um, thinking about psychology because I, I'm I'm not going to uh, to wade into that that area because uh, I've got very little knowledge of psychology. Um, on in terms of like ethos uh, or moral choices. Uh, put yourself into the the shoes a, of a random civilian, okay, and you see that sort the footage coming from your soldiers. So you are faced with two choices: either uh, condemn it mm -hmm. and say this is this is immoral, uh, this is not us, we should not allow this, or no, 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 this is our army, these are our kids, they can do no wrong. And we have to support them, which means all of a sudden, whatever they're doing becomes acceptable. And you will find reasons, justifications to justify it. And I think that, that is what happened to the, uh, the, the, the Russian society. And to a certain extent, you've seen it at work in the US. A huge portion of the U.S. population uh, supported. Um, um, can't remember his rank. His rank, sorry. Uh, that Navy SEAL Gallagher. Yeah, who was exonerated by Trump, right? Like, right. It, he was pardoned. Yeah, pardoned. but he was yeah. actually he was he was uh, uh, sentenced. So, in the eyes of the law, he is actually guilty. No, I, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, there there was a, this group that really rallied. I mean, even in the in the first Gulf War, there there's this horrible story. So much stupid things came out of the the first Gulf War, the uh, you know ninety one does ninety one ninety two, where um, you know there was this sort of country music band, the Dixie Chicks, that sort of made some dissenting comments, and they were immediately canceled. 
and uh, there was a sense that you have to rally around the troops no matter what, and they can do no wrong, and, and you have to rally. In the sake of rallying around the troops, I mean, for Americans, it was also like you know, part of it was there's this there's this bad memory that I think a lot of us have. There's this sort of bad conscious, uh, at least on the part of frankly baby boomers, for the sort of the 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 whole baby killer thing about the soldiers yeah. who were in Vietnam. And the treatment so of Vietnam. Right. Oh, yeah. So there's a sense that you, you have to go to the opposite extreme and then you have to embrace anything they do because it's all okay. Uh, but then, right, this quickly becomes, wittingly or not, this this opening for pushing that over to window of... of yeah. and, and it's very hard to draw a line and say, we support the troops, God bless them, but we can't do this. I was thinking of a, a, a film that you know that was I, I thought was absolutely appalling, um, Lone Survivor. I've not seen it. So after I can imagine. Marcus, so Marcus Luttrell, interesting bloke. Uh, so he wrote this book uh, about him being the lone survivor and basically uh, being hidden by an Afghan who saved his life and so on and so forth. But when you look closely, uh, you realize that. The book was written by a ghostwriter, uh, not Luttrell himself, of course, very shortly after the uh, the operation, and um, a lot of it doesn't hold up. And upon further investigation, when you ask the actual guys from the other side, and also the Afghan who saved Luttrell, they tell you a completely different story, which is sort of normal. But what's interesting is that the book itself, and Luttrell himself, later on, kept on av advocating for basically a uh, more relaxed ROE and basically pinning um, whatever failed in Afghanistan on the fact that um, they were not allowed to do war crimes. Um, so that's, that's also interesting because it, it, what it shows is that um, there's a portion of the military which is not adhering to um, values. They usually have sworn an oath protect yes um and where does tiktok come into that well if you think that there is an appetite for content that goes against those values how much is a 20 year old soldier is he going to think oh, i shouldn't be doing that that's not who we are or is he going to think Oh, if I do this, if I show this, I'm going to get a huge number of likes and shares. As I said, like TikTok is different from everything that's been done before because it's immediate. Mm -hmm. The guy can record whatever he's doing, his little thing. He edits it in minutes and he posts it on social media and it's out. It's so fascinating. I and mean, imagine if and, the soldiers, the, North, the the British Army soldiers in Northern Ireland had TikTok. Like, what what would have happened? Um, we, but well, that's interesting. Um, you you can no longer rewrite the narrative as as you could not that long ago. A lot of things happen in Northern Ireland. Um, it's a little bit too close uh, to us. To really know, and I and I think that uh, we don't look too much because the the peace process is not finished yet. So okay. um, there are so, a lot of like wounds. Which, Battle of Algiers. I mean, I mean, coming going back, going back. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the the famous the British absolutely love to say uh, how they are really good at counterinsurgency because of uh, of the Malian insurgency. <laughs> I never bought that. I'm sorry. Exactly, but upon, upon closer look, you realize that first of all, of course, the uh, the enemy itself was like sort of like a very weakened version of like um, whatever everybody else faced afterwards, or yeah. at the same time. Yeah. But also that they absolutely uh, uh, indulge into behaviors uh, that would amount to war crimes, uh, and British that Army. Basically were, were war crimes. Right. Yeah, and. Also, and same thing in, in, in Yemen as well. Um, and you actually, the worst thing is that you actually have footage of it. 
if, if you look at footage from, from Yemen, for instance, you can absolutely see the guys grabbing um, Yemeni Arabs, putting them on a truck, and, 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 and beating the, the, the crap out of them. And, but did it make it to audiences straight away during the conflict? No. No. It took a lot afterwards. Yeah. But in the meantime, the narrative had been written. By regimental histories, by autobiographies, by, you know, and the image that they had was that of a clean, um, clean war, clean operation. Mm -hmm. I think about how carefully curated our memory of a lot of historical conflicts have been, you know. World I mean, II, it's, still, it's still, still, it's still the case. If you look, if you look at how, how things were shown in Bender Brothers, for instance, compared yeah, exactly. to the, the Pacific. Yeah. The Pacific was much more honest about 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 the, the behaviors of uh, of American service people, uh, service personnel, mm -hmm. than than the brothers. But then the brothers wasn't based on history; it was based on regimental history. Regimental history is no history at all; it's a narrative, right? And it's sort of a bit of iconography. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I was always amazed, like when relatively recently I found some books that that basically were documented documented um rapes by american forces of germans and they're actually photographs of victims and like murder german civilians and or, or even recently i read about how uh i was doing some work on i was reading something about the world world war one and about how like french officials had a, they begged pershing to open up brothels because the the doughboys were raping too many french women and you know, dour puritanical Pershing it was it was a very hard sell for him. But he, he funny yeah. conceded. But I think only after all these doctors, army doctors, sort of prevailed upon him. When the French army had actually its own brothels. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the point is, is like none of this stuff enters. You know, that the fact that the greatest generation yeah, raped course, its yeah. way across Europe, perhaps not to the extent that the Red Army did. And, but and, and I mean, going back, going back to Band of Brothers, it, it's it's funny how they depict the interactions. Uh, uh, it's you know you have Per Conte basically sitting next to a nice German Fraulein, yeah. And the camera basically goes away, and next thing you know, he's getting out of the of of the barn, uh, basically rubbing his cheek because he's he got a slap. Right, right. Whereas in reality, he might have raped her. Okay, so basically, this is this is what happened. So he tried to kiss her, and he got the slap. Right. Yeah. Okay. That was the Bill Malden view. I don't know if you're familiar with the World War II cartoonist Bill Malden, who wrote this marvelous. I have it somewhere. It was actually from my grandfather who owned it. But it's like there are these scenes, these really innocent scenes of these these GIs trying to flirt yeah. with, uh, with German the girls, and there's always yeah. like you know, she thought I was serious when I told her, asked her to teach me how to yodel, right? And yeah, and, you know. She, <laughs> So she gave me a yodeling lesson, and it's just no, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, it's very cute. And it's interesting. It's uh, it's uh, it's sort of like it's alluded to in a much more threatening manner in in Fury. Yes, that's a in great the dinner scene. scene. Um, but it's still not shown. That's that's also interesting. It's still, not, right. it doesn't happen. It's there. It's like handling, hanging above, like you know, our heads, like yeah. Right. Damocles and swords, but so now, now your part of your argument is that these people might have all behaved differently if with TikTok, and not necessarily for the better. <laughs> not necessarily for the better, not necessarily yeah. for the worse. As as I said, so there there are the people doing it. There are the um, unforeseen consequences, or maybe the unthought consequences that are not basically taken into account. And uh, on on the other side, the as I said, like maybe some people have an interest into into those contents actually being aired for um, local audiences um, without thinking too much about like further consequences. But basically, because maybe they don't have the same time frame in terms of like their own goals. Um, political goals time frame are usually election time frames. Yes. Not necessarily strategic time frames, which is something that has hampered our own efforts during you know the wars in Afghanistan and, and and Iraq because we were looking to the next term, the well the end of term, the beginning of a new one before like you know um, doing this thing. And, and this is where like as I said, like TikTokization is basically very fast, 
and all in terms of timeline um it serves some purposes in a certain timeline but not in the wider one mm -hmm. because in the wider context of the other timeline it can serve a completely different purpose oh or it can be harmful to yes. whoever made it right because once it's on the internet it's there it's permanent yeah it is interesting. I mean, I feel like the whole thing adds this whole other level to the battlefield. There's this whole other thing. You know, Percy never had to think about this stuff. No, uh, he didn't. No. And I, th I think, I think, I think, um, and it, it's weird because, like, I, I think the Ukrainians managed basically to ride it really well. Yes. And yes. they've been really smart about this. I'm not sure we would be able to do the same. But there's a whole study to be made about how they did it and how consciously and witty yeah. it was and who's doing it. Is there some sort of command and control behind it? Is there some sort of... I don't, I don't think there is. Uh, um, well, I think, I think s there is a measure of it. I think there is a filter. Mm -hmm. they, so they let people record, but they don't let anything get out before it's actually like checked. And because of that, they can control it but not only they can control it, but they have a vast pool of videos to tap into of material, raw material. Right, right. For propaganda purposes. I was thinking about how, um, you know, all my interactions, personal interactions with the IDF have just been with kids. They're kids, like 19 year old. And I, you know, I, I know go back are. to sort of like the jackass at war kind of thing are. of the, of the, the, the Gulf they, War. I mean, yeah. But there is obviously, there's a professional army and the professional cadres. I've never actually interacted with them. And I don't know how they interact with the kids. And I don't know, uh, you know, a lot of it might just be this, like, is it just indulgence of like the kids be kids? Is it, is it, Right, some mixture of negligence, policy, deliberate orders. I have no idea where it comes out and what's happening. And again, like I, I have no insight into how much control hierarchy has or wants to have, because those are two different things. Yeah, but over I mean, the the kids. You you look at it this way, okay? When 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 you when you see in terms of like sexual violence, what happened during October 7th. And, you know, the Arab world being absolutely shocked by guys showing underwear, you think, guys, come on, you, 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 aren't, aren't, you can't do that comparison. But that's a problem. Um, the Arab audiences are. So, um, so the, it, it requires a an awareness of being able to imagine well, how is this perceived in other people's eyes you know of course like i'm thinking are you thinking about the, footage of the, the footage because, of the hamas uh, detainees in but, the underwear yeah yeah but it's yeah. it's the whole it's a whole it's the whole gravitas of it it's it's uh, it, it, if you go into a technicization of war all of a sudden you forget the dignity of your own military function if you right. think that you're just a citizen in uniform and you've been given a rifle and off you go have fun this is what you're going to do. And this is why I think that higher up, um, there has been some sort of guideline, directive, whatever you want to call it, to say, like, leave them. Instead of, guys, you're professional soldiers, which they aren't, but if they were, you're professional soldiers, you aren't there to fool around. Yeah, I think, I think, I think. I think that's the difference that you have. And the thing is, like, in Ukraine, they might have the same behaviors. The difference is, like, that footage is not making past, making it past the filter. I try to imagine what happens, you know, like, if the GIs in Vietnam had these things. Like, I mean, God knows what we would have seen. But even without it, you had, like, the, the guys were basically smoking Mary Jane in front of cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and also the guys with rings and, and ears. Shotguns. Right, yeah. Char right, Charlie ears like around the garlands, like yeah. even that happened. So, and Miss July, Miss July struck to their Alice backpack. <laughs> yeah, is that just what happens when you have a conscript army? I mean, those those weren't professionals in Vietnam. Those were conscripts. No, not, the professionals not, were in but Germany. that's the thing. It's not. It's not so much like conscript or anything like that. It's a general breakdown in 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 the, in, in Vietnam. You faced a general breakdown, and. 
the US Army uh, took 10 years to come back from it. From, from 1975 to 1985, it rebuilt itself. And it rebuilt itself, including the, the ethos, a lot. No, it, it, was, it was in a very bad way. And because this is just part of it. I mean, the, at the other end of the spectrum, you had guys throwing grenades into the, their officers' tents. Mm -hmm. You had fragging. So it is part of the same breakdown in discipline. I imagine it happened amongst the Soviets in Afghanistan as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course it did. Because yeah. the Soviets, the Soviets and... except that the, yeah, but except that the Soviets were also allowed by their chain of command to be much more brutal. Does that forgive the word? Does that help? Right? If there's a like a an explicit permission to vent certain bad inclinations. It's not venting. It's making it basically acting on them. Yeah, but it's it's basically authorizing um, a way of doing war. But it's you can't come back from that unless you have some sort of reckoning. Ryan, thank you very much for sharing these your your perspectives and insights with us. Uh, it was a real pleasure. Uh, as always, you you never disappoint, and uh, I look forward to the next time I, I bring you on. And to to those watching, please like and subscribe and. Uh, absolutely subscribe to his channel yeah i'm actually a subscriber so okay. there you go okay so please like and subscribe and also uh check out uh the, the links in the description for please check out my sub stack uh the, again the link in the description and you can come find me on linkedin and twitter and michaelshirkin.com thank you very much and thank you for joining us ryan pleasure was mine honor was mine um and yeah i'm looking forward to see your next videos Great. Likewise. <laughs> no, just to make them. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>